Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. Today is kind of a sad day for us here at Darkness Radio. We lost a good friend of our show, a good friend to us personally, Tim Yancey. Tim was the host of Encounters Radio along with his partner, Jason Gowan, and his wife, Trish. They were some of the first people that really kind of uh, buddied up with Tim and I when we began Darkness Radio. Tim was a great guy, fantastic man, and just a, a great speaker and a lot of fun. He was very knowledgeable regarding the Amityville case. He had become very close friends with George Lutz, and they would tour with him and tell these stories and share insights from Amityville. Today, we're going to do a throwback episode to our very first interview from 2008. We hope that you'll enjoy this, and it's a good chance to revisit with an old friend. We'll miss you, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen from the Darkives, here's Darkness Radio from 2008. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free, and things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Good evening and welcome to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, sitting across from the board from me, Mr. Tim Dennis. Good evening, Tim. Hey there. Hey, we got uh, some exciting stuff happening here. We've got uh, our Waverly Hills trip is up and for sale. It's going to take place at the end of July, July 27th through the 30th, two nights to investigate Waverly Hills. Um, You don't get one, you get a full two nights to uh, go out there. We've got some great talks and lectures that are going to be taking place. So check out that information by going to darknessevents.com. Also, we have about 20, 25 tickets left for the Queen Mary event. And it looks like this could be our last Queen Mary event uh, because new management regime at the Queen Mary is trying to stray away from some of the paranormal aspects of it. And they're they're trying to price us out of the ballpark from doing events there. So I, I think this may very well be the last Darkness Radio Taps paranormal retreat at Queen Mary. So mm. go check that out at Darkness Events as well. Wow, we had a lot of uh, a lot of stuff go on in the last week, Timothy. Yeah, yeah. We've lost, uh, you know, Sidney Pollack passed away. Yep. So that's a, that's a shame, of course. And, yep. uh, you know, uh, Indiana Jones... And the, Passed away? Uh, yes. No. Oh. Did you hear? $311 million opening weekend. I think Spielberg got to say, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, we can't do 500 here, people? So do you think that's going to spawn some more sequels? Are we going to see no, uh, the adventures of Mutt Jones and the Temple of I wanna see, Scooby-Doo or something? I want something? to see Indiana Jones run away from a boulder with a walker in yes. hand. Yeah, that, it was a great movie. I will say that. I really enjoyed it. A lot of people are beating up on it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Just an entertaining movie and, and a, a, you know, harken us back to the 80s when you could have just a good time and, and let go with a movie. So I would definitely mm-hmm. recommend it. But, yeah, $311 millions. A lot of cool stuff going on. Um, again, please keep Denise and Michael Jones in your prayers. Michael uh, Jones is a son of Denise Jones. Uh, she uh, he, he had cardiac arrest about a week and a half, two weeks back now, and is still recuperating. Um, they're still having problems with blood clots. So uh, please keep them in your prayers and in your thoughts and send out your healing energy and Reiki. Do everything we can. If we can come together as a community, we can make this boy healthy again. Uh, and with the help of uh, our God and everybody that's uh, out there listening, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see uh, Mike back on his feet and feeling better real soon. Now, Tim. Yes, sir. Been on the year almost three years. Oh, yeah, two and a half. All right. Well, it's yeah. almost three. It's closer to three than it is to one. So mm. I'll fudge the numbers a little. No, it's Shut up. See, Stop it's, it. Don't so beat me up. Yeah, it's two and a half. And the one thing we've avoided, like the plague, uh-huh. is talking about Amityville. <gasps> yeah. You know, because I felt it's been kicked around and talked about and beaten up and roughed up enough. Yeah. Even when we've had the lovely Lorraine Warren on the show, I've refused to talk to her about Amityville, which is pissing off a lot of our listeners because they want to get into 
her perspective on Amityville. Mm-hmm. I feel she has, you know, 40 years of investigating, 50 years of investigating of other really great, co- you know, cases and courses. So we've tried to keep it, keep it that. Well, I've, I'll tell you what, I've had the opportunity in the last year to meet a really great guy. Um, uh, he's got his own radio show out of uh, Florida. It's called Encounters Paranormal Radio Series. It's uh, based out of West Palm Beach, Florida. They broadcast on Clear Channel's WBZT. That's 1230 a.m. And it's also a live stream on the Internet. You can listen to it live at www.encounterslive.com. Uh, they bring you some of the best in paranormal entertainment each week. They have guests that have ranged everywhere from D. Wallace Stone, you know, the mom from E.T. Yep. I think she was in the original Howling movie as well, uh, to heavy hitters like, um, you know, members of the Ghost Hunters and TAPS team. Mm-hmm. Uh, they bring out a, a new guest and a new topic, uh, talking about the unexplained every week, and it's hosted by Tim Yancey, who is our guest tonight. And Tim, uh, aside from being a longtime paranormal researcher, he has also dealt with malicious hauntings in his life, and he was he ended up becoming friends with uh, George Lutz from the Amityville Horror Case. Mm-hmm. And listening to Tim do a few talks at these events, uh, you know, it re-inspired me to maybe we should reinvestigate a little bit of the Amityville Horror and and bring some of the cases up. And I'm going to beat up Tim a little bit today, and I've done my research and looking stuff up on uh, the hoax angle of it, and I want to hopefully get to the bottom of some of the the answers, at least from Tim's perspective and knowing George and and having researched this subject. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for our guest this evening, Mr. Tim Yancey. Good evening, Tim. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Doing great. How about yourself, sir? Wow, fantastic intro. Thank you. Hey, well, now tell everybody so they can listen. You're on every Sunday night, correct? Right. We come on just before your show, actually, at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, like you said, it's at EncountersLive.com. So, yep, you guys check that out. You can tune in and listen to the show prior to the uh, um, uh, prior to our show. You get three hours that way of content of uh, some of the best the paranormal field has to offer and, and some great interviews. And, Tim, now l- let's get into this a little bit now. Um, with your show and, and your research into the paranormal, you talk about the fact that you dealt with a malicious haunting as well. Can you give us uh, some background? Tell us a little bit about what happened to you to push you into the field. Sure. Uh, this started for me, my interest in the paranormal got started, like a lot of people's does, um, from first-hand experience. Um, as a child, I, I lived in Florida, and it was, uh, it was a pretty different place back then. There wasn't a lot of big cities like you have now back in the 60s. And so I lived way west of town, and we were out, you know, pretty remote um, where we lived. And I had an encounter in the woods near my home with something that um, I could not physically see but i could see the environment reacting to it it was very frightening for me it had an incredible impact on my life of course i ran fast as i could run back to the house and that began i guess what you would call a haunting for Mm -hmm. um some 30 years my family was um involved in this and experienced a lot of this stuff i've had a lot of friends over the years who have as well and it was because of that that i started to um, kind of reach out to the paranormal community back then. There wasn't a lot of people that were doing this like there is now. Right. <laughs> so I, I started to reach out and, and talk to people like John Zaffis, who is just an incredible violent hauntings case investigator. Uh, other people included Mary Pascarella, who, in, who was one of the first people to investigate the Amityville case, and George Lutz, of course, and other people that had been involved in violent hauntings, and I was trying to find out what was going on and how to put a stop to it. Now, when you're saying violent hauntings, too, with, with the stuff, I mean, did you did you fear for your life? People are always asking, you know, can, can ghosts kill us or hurt us? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I can say that it was very frightening. There were times when... Um, I remember going to the hospital because I broke both of my collarbones, and it wasn't from anything that an entity did, but it was me reacting to it. You know, when something scratches you across the ribs or or is poking at your feet when you're asleep at night, um, (laughs) I bolted up from the bed and took off running and hit the first wall I could find, and (laughs) that put me into the hospital. (laughs) Thank God Um, that wall was there to stop your fall, huh? (laughs) I'm saying... (laughs) Oh God! But it, but it was it was very frightening for me. It probably affected my brother worse than it did me, and it went on for a long time. And it affected my life and changed my life in ways that you know we could talk about all day. So, 
are you now has this residually followed you into adulthood and into your new lives and into you know your part of the world or does it just stay centered around the home and the areas that you grow up in well it's it's something that i have i don't like to call it a haunting I, I really don't. I, I'm not real high on the on the term violent haunting or malicious haunting or anything. I look at it kind of like a parasite more than anything else. What this does is it creates an air of confusion. It kind of blurs the reality that you're looking at. You start to question what's going on in your head and things like that. And it took a long time and a lot of talking with people like George Lutz to understand that one, the less attention you give it, um, the better off you are. And two, that there are things that you can do. There's tools that you can use to empower your life, you know, to help you deal with this stuff. Um, it feeds off of negative energy, I found. And things like inserting love and laughter and humor and faith and those types of things into your life, it really does a number on this stuff. And the effects have really lessened to where... Thankfully, I can say in the last year, probably two years, there have been incidents, but, but minor ones. And, you know, I'm at a place where I can move on with my life and, and go about day-to-day -day things and, and really put that at rest. Do you do paranormal investigations yourself where you'll go out to homes or businesses where people need help? I, I, I don't like to do investigations um, because ghosts just scare me right to death. <laughs> but, um, you know, there are investigators out there that do this stuff. I, I have gone on a few. I've been to places of interest that have interested me. Um, George and I, when he was doing conferences towards the end of his life, he did a handful of conferences here and there around the country. And when we were in locations, we would go out. We'd go to places like the Devil's Tramping Grounds, uh, we went to Appomattox in Virginia, uh, Thomas Jefferson's summer home, places that we had heard of that were interesting, and uh, we wanted to go out and look at those, but not in a role that you would think of like Jason and Grant or Patrick Burns or somebody, not with equipment and, you know. Did you ever, like did you ever fear for yourself, though, Tim, that by going out and investigating and keeping, you know, putting yourself into that field that it could just continue to perpetuate the problems that you were dealing with? Definitely. That's a real fear for me. Um, and also, do you have a fear that, uh, you know, by going in, and, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, if you have something, as you said, like a parasite attached to you that's kind of leeching off you and doing damage, if people are, are aware that they do have a haunting of their own, I know you don't like to use that term, but if, if, they're, if they're having their own issues with, with something out of this world, <coughs> which it seems a lot of paranormal investigators do, do you yeah. think that that can also then open up a world of trouble for the people whose homes and businesses you're being called into to investigate? It's definitely a possibility. You know, I think back to a movie called The Mothman Prophecies, and there's a guy in there trying to explain to Richard Gere what this stuff is. And he says in there that if you take an interest in the paranormal, there's probably a really good chance that it may take an interest in you as well. Right. And I do believe that's a strong possibility. I also think that the more that, you know, it's like holding up a candle in the darkness there. You never know what may be attracted to it. So for me, yeah, it's a very real possibility. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you that I've done a handful of conferences recently in the last year, and it's something I get very nervous about. The first one I did in Arkansas, I, I physically got ill <laughs> beforehand. I was really nervous about it. This last one that we did in Mid-South, I rode in the back of the plane because I passed out on the plane. You know, I, I, get, I, I get a lot of anxiety about doing this stuff, and sometimes there is retribution from doing those kind of things, sure. So, uh, Tim, you're, you're that affected by the paranormal. What keeps you in it and investigating it and trying to get answers if you're worried that this could be causing you problems? Dave, it's, it, it's because of people that I've met along the way, and it's because of my childhood and my upbringing. You know, I would have loved to have been a, a kid that grew up and was interested in cars and girls and living <laughs> a, a normal teen life. But I didn't, and I had this thing that, that um, I, one, was obsessed with and trying to get help with. It wasn't a very fun thing. And I've met people along the way, people like a five-year-old girl in 
in North Carolina who looked at George while we were at a book signing one day for the Amityville Horror. And she looked at him, she says, does the bad people ever go away? And mm -hmm. we found out from that that there was something that was going in her room at night and, and pulling her clothing out of the drawers of her room. And, and it would sit in a corner and it would sniff her clothing and say vile absurdities and, and things. You know, this is a, it's a violation for the people that go through it. And my thing in doing this, sure, I get to talk about Amityville, but I also get time to go in there and make the statement that, hey, this is real. It happens to people. It's very frightening. And when it does, it is something that has such a profound impact on their life that, um, you know, we can't measure it. How many people you see jumping off of these bridges and things that may have been affected by this, but we never heard their story? And they were led to that extreme. And, and that's why I do what I do, because for me, it was frightening. Um, and it's something that I have experience in and that I can talk to, uh, to people about and maybe help them out along the way. Now, do you believe that you've worked with, uh, or not worked with, but dealt with a demonic form or just a, a really crabby spirit? I don't know. Um, demonic is, is not a word that I like to use. I, I'll tell you that it was definitely an evil energy that affected our family. It was something that tried to, t I don't know, the agenda seemed to be to um, scare us to death, to cause fear, to cause confusion. It was kind of a breakdown of us as a family. Um, and it seemed to feed off of that, and so it created that for us. Um, as far as demonic, you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren have always said that the thing that was in the house at Amityville was demonic, and a lot of people use that phrase. Well, Lorraine and Ed were very devout Catholics as well. They were raised in the Catholic faith, and they were taught that that's what this stuff is. And so if you have to label it by that, that's fine, you know, if that's their realm of understanding of it. I have no problem with that, but I don't know. Um, when it comes to demonic, I'm, I'm just not real big on that term because it, it, a lot of people are confused by it. Oh, I agree. I think there's a lot of people that misrepresent, or, or I shouldn't even say misrepresent, but mistake things that are, are not even malevolent for being demonic yeah. because it's something that scares them. That's true. Um, you, know, doing, you know, we've talked about this at our events, where just because you feel somebody pull your hair or poke you or, you know, um, give you a little shove or a plate falls off the you know countertop doesn't necessarily right. mean that it was evil. Maybe that's all it can do with the energy that it has to let you know that it's there. So jumping to conclusions that uh, you've automatically got Satan, you know, mucking with your life is is maybe a little bit of an uh, you know overstatement, and, and it should be looked at more realistically to what it is that you're dealing with. Uh, I, I totally understand it. For people that don't you know, really get what's going on, if you think about the fact like a bully, bullies feed off of the ability of scaring you and keeping you in control. Um, sure. You know, you watch movies about uh, abusive, controlling men, like, uh, you know, The Enemy Within, I think, with Julia Roberts from back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh -huh. or, uh, or Sleeping with the Enemy, I think it was called. Um, here's this man who lived on tormenting her, beating the crap out of her, and getting that that up. So if that's what these spirits love to do, and they kind of feed off of the energy that you give in those heightened states of, of terror or um, anxiousness, Right. And that's that's going to make it open for you. So mm -hmm. I can see I've I've had a lot of people come to me that say, yeah, Dave, you know, everybody tells us, well, if you think about it or you deal with it, you're giving it power. Just ignore it. But we've noticed that when we ignore it, it gets angrier and more violent and more malevolent. Have you found that at all in cases that you've dealt with or researched? Sure. Um, well, I haven't I haven't really investigated a lot of cases, but from personal experience, I can tell you that that's the case. Um I know that in Amityville, they tried to cleanse the house themselves. They had a friend come, say, come over and say, oh, well, all you have to do is, you know, bless the house. Open the windows, say the Lord's Prayer, tell whatever's there to leave, and it'll go. And that didn't work for them. Actually, it got worse. Um, in Stephen Lachance's case, who I know has been a guest on your show, he had a lot of turmoil already with the family there. He had just gotten a, a rather messy divorce. He was trying to find a place to live because he was basically homeless when he found the house. So there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of inner stuff going on in, in a negative way 
that may have attracted this to it. Um, the, the good news about all of this in doing the research that I've done with people like Carmen Reed and Steve and them and John is that I found out that for some reason it's like spraying um, insecticide on a bug, that if you can inject as much positiveness into your life, um, those things that we talked about, just even the power of journaling, writing. I started at a place where I had to get a journal and just write down something positive in it every day. And from there, I started taking further steps, you know, starting to um, have better social relationships. And um, I started going to church, and that's something that I found that worked for me because <clears throat> I was surrounded by people who are in a positive light and faith, humor, laughter. Oh my gosh, humor! I don't think evil understands the concept of, of humor. It doesn't get it. It's not something that's built into its makeup. See, Tim, and that's those, the problem with my ex-wives. They must have been <laughs> evil. They just didn't get my humor. That's it. That's it. All right, I got you. <laughs> but I, I think that those things really do help. Help this. I, I can tell you from personal experience that. In talking to Steve, Carmen, all these folks that you see on TV that have been through violent hauntings, and in my case, every one of them will tell you that those are the things that have worked to help alleviate some of this stuff in their case. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here for our first uh, break of this hour. You're listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Or our guest, Mr. Tim Yancey, he's also the host of Encounters Live. You can listen to that every Sunday night just leading up to our show. You can do that by going to www.encounterslive.com. If you're out in the uh, Florida area on Clear Channel, you can check out WBZT, 1230 AM, and it's the hour leading up to our show. So uh, I believe that's 9 to uh, nine o'clock till 10. Is that right, uh, Eastern Time? Yeah. Right. Okay. It's 9, Nine to 10, 10 Eastern Standard. All right. Great. Well, check that out. And again, remember to look at the website, EncountersLive.com. We're going to come back with more and talk a little bit uh, more in depth about the Amityville Horror right after this. It will keep you on the edge of your seat. I must have drank me about 15 Dr. Peppers. I got to pay. Just don't get any on the floor. Hurry back. There is more to come from the darkness on the edge of town. <laughs> Okay, each of you youngins take a gun, a beer, and some smoke. Throttle circuit breakers in. We have separation. In board now, boards are on. We're coming forward with the side stick. Looks good. I've got a blowout. Paper three. Get your pitch to zero. Pitch is out. I can't hold out the two. Direction alpha hold is off. Trip selected emergency. Flight calm. I can't hold it. She's breaking up. She's breaking. Dave. You bastard! Dave Schrader, paranormal host. A man barely alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic paranormal host. Dave Schrader will be that man better than he was before. What is it that makes you set up? Better. Stronger. Faster. Run, Lord, run! Run, Lord! Welcome back to The Darkness on the Edge of Town with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis. Welcome back to the show, and thank you for listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio. We're here with you every Sunday night from 10 to midnight Central Time. And uh, if you can't listen live, remember all of our shows are archived on our website. Simply go to darknessradio.com, click on the archives, and you can listen to the past two and a half years' worth of shows by downloading them. You can also sign up on our site so that you can be a part of the RSS feed and uh, never miss an episode. You'll always get it updated for your iPod and, and uh, be able to follow along with the show. Our guest this evening we're talking to is uh, coming to us out of uh, Florida on the uh, Clear Channel, WBZT 1230 AM. He is uh, the host of Encounters, and uh, you can also hear that by going to www.encounterslive.com. You can listen anywhere in the world by going to www.encounterslive.com and uh, spend a little uh, time with Tim Yancey and the crew every night just before you come over to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. 
Tim, let's talk about uh, let's start getting into the Amityville horror stuff. How did you end up meeting George Lutz, and and at what age and and so on were you at that when you uh, hooked up with George? Well, well, first I have to say that you have the best commercials I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that <laughs> that, great. That's the all intro. Tim. Yeah, Tim. Tim does all the hard work for us here. <laughs> Those are fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Amityville. Uh, this started. I had talked to George uh, via phone several times, but the first time we met was an appearance he made at Penn State University at a place called Univcon, which is a huge conference that they hold up there right. uh, every year. <clears throat> and I met him at Univcon, too. And I was an audio engineer at the time, and I was sent up to record the shows. And uh, a lot of people were there, and George and I were like the only two old guys there. It's a college town, you know, and everybody's <laughs> really young. So we kind of naturally tended to hang out together, and um, that's where we met. And I remember it was Halloween night at a Denny's at 2 o'clock in the morning after his, his talk that he gave that we sat down and we started to talk about this stuff. And I had begun to tell him a lot more about the haunting and stuff that had occurred to my family. And he sat and, and talked about Amityville. And from there, our, our friendship grew. And um, eventually, next thing I knew, I was running AmityvilleHorror.com, which was a website that he wanted to create. And together, we built that up until the day he passed away. And now, is that site still up for people to take a look at and review? It is. Um, there's two websites, actually. One is AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, and the other is AmityvilleHorror.com. And those are uh, when he passed away in May. Um, I haven't changed them since then, and they're up just um, the way that he left them. Right. That was, uh, you know, we had actually just reached out to try to have George on the show. I think it was about a month or so beforehand, and somebody kind of claiming to be one of his handlers said that they would help us arrange it, and then unfortunately we got the news of his uh, of his passing. Um, now, when you met George, I mean, a lot of people said he was a very nice guy, but you know, a lot of the, the haters out there and, and people that have spent their lives trying to debate this hoax uh, also say that, you know, he's a really good BSer and con artist. What did you get a feel from when you were talking to him? Did you get the feel that there was some, you know, a little bit of flourish being told in these stories? Well, well, George was definitely a person who uh, had a very sarcastic sense of humor. Uh, he had a very okay. self-deprecating sense of humor as well. Very funny guy. Um, it was one of those tools that we talked about earlier. And, and so, yeah, he had a lot of humor in him. When it came to talking about these hauntings in his case and working with other people, that tone would change um, instantly. Um, it was something that he was very serious about. It was, um, you know, it, that family had spent 30 years basically being called liars by the community at large, and so they had stepped out of uh, the public eye for, for a long time. And it was only very recently in the last few years of his life there that he had once again started to come out and talk about this stuff. And for him, it was, it was um, the same thing. He got to talk about Amityville, but at the same time, he got to inject that um, there were ways to deal with this stuff. And that was very important to him. What can you separate for us, fact from fiction, from what was being shown in the movies and in Jay Anson's book? Because what I've been told, Jay Anson just kind of, you know, he took some of the real points and then flourished them and, and made them a lot more. And is there any truth to that? Is there any truth to the fact that George and Kathy were not happy with the way the book portrayed the actual haunting and, and the story? Sure. Um, George always said, I remember on, on several occasions, him saying that of everything that was out there about Amityville, that the book was probably the most accurate um, telling of the story. With that said, it, it, Jay Anson was also uh, an award-winning novelist. He, his big thing was uh, history, especially military history and war chronicles and things like that. And he knew how to write a best-selling novel. Um, George and Kathy, at the time that they met Jay Anson and decided that they were going to go ahead with this book, they really weren't at a place in their lives where they were willing to do endless amounts of interviews about this stuff and, and be interviewed for the book. But what they did do was they gave him a series of cassette tapes. They had earlier created uh, what he called self-help tapes where they would sit around the table and just talk about this stuff, and they wanted to record it and to get it down on tape. 
and um, it wasn't the most coherent as far as a storyline would go. Um, they would just recall incidences as best as they could recall. Now, um, it turned out to be about 40 hours of tapes. They gave those to Jay Anson and said, here you go, you know, you can do your best with these, and we'll try to help you in making corrections. They would send out galleys, and Kathy wasn't really interested in trying to edit the galley sheets, but George would do the best that he could with it. And from that, Jay wrote the novel. Now, Jay um, didn't get everything right. Of course, there was creative license used in the book. Um, a lot of the incidences, you know, Jay was interested in writing a best-selling novel, not necessarily telling the, the most accurate story right. that he could. And from that came the book, and then later the movies, and the movies were really bad in terms of accuracy. I mean, the last movie that MGM did um, showed him uh, seven attempts of murder on his family and his wife, those types of things, killing the dog, all types of stuff. So that created a lot of confusion for people in, uh, in the telling of the story. Well, right. I mean, they definitely took some creative license in the, the newest version of the movie, but I think that was to kind of change things up because people were familiar with the original movie and they were looking to just scare it. It almost got right. the sense that they gave up on the idea of it being a real story and just decided to change it into a, you know, a, a, a really well-written horror book that they turned into a new movie. True, but a, a lot of people took the movies and the book as gospel, and the biggest mistake that they made was they printed a true story on the cover rather than based on a true story. And so everybody took every word that was in the book as gospel. A lot of those things didn't happen. Of course, there wasn't blood dripping down the walls or those types of things. Uh, there was no pit of hell in the basement that George fell into, <laughs> any of that kind of okay. stuff. Um, How did George was, feel about the remake? Um, <clears throat> if, I, if I recall hearing at the time, he was really quite irritated with it in the way that it portrayed him yeah. as some psycho. Yeah, well, they had rights to remake the movie, and um, from what I understand, it was based on the concept of the same basic characters in the same basic story. And for him, um, I'm sure that it was more than tough for him to see him planting an axe in his wife's chest when she had just passed away during the making of the film, during the production of the film. Uh, Kathy had... Um, what's known as valley fever. It's an airborne contaminant uh, lung type of the disease. And she was very frail and very, very uh, sick, and she passed away during the filming. So that was tough for George to go into a movie theater and see some of the scenes portrayed in there. Um, there were lawsuits back and forth between them. And uh, in the end, George lost the lawsuits, and then he passed away. And always with with a real chip on his shoulder about how his family was portrayed in that movie. With all this, the one thing I think a lot of people, uh, one of the misnomers, and I don't know if you could shed some light on this, is a lot of people just, you know, wrote this off as it was just a couple looking to <clears throat> raise a lot of money by writing a really good, you know, ghost story and, and making up a lot of allegations. First of all, shed a little light on it for people. How, just how rich did George and Kathy Lutz get from the Amityville Horror? From what I can remember of him stating, and this is just from memory, I believe they made from the books and movies roughly $300,000, $350,000, something like that. Um, I can tell you that with the amount of lawsuits, there's been some 20 lawsuits regarding Amityville Horror over the years, that more than that has gone back into defending the family name and defending the rights for them to even accurately tell one day of their story. So the people that say that they were going to get rich, here's a family that's a newlywed family with children who are moving into a new home and on the hopes that perhaps a book might be written and that perhaps that book will be a bestseller and maybe they'll do a movie on it and, you know, I don't buy it. That just doesn't work for me. The math doesn't add up. <laughs> right. Well, that was the whole intent, as people said, that they sunk all this money into a house that they couldn't afford with the intention of flipping this house around and, and uh, making a million dollars off of the rights in the story when, in fact, they gave everything that they had up. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. I mean, what was not to afford? Kathy and George both owned a house at the time when they had gotten married, and they had gone out and looked at probably 30 or 40 homes over the summer. 
before they found this one. The realtor with Conklin Realty, Edith Evans, showed them the house at 112 Ocean Avenue. Um, and the idea was to sell Kathy's house first, which eventually did sell for well over $40,000. She moved in with George in his Deer Park home. Um, from there, they found the house and made arrangements to start moving in, sold George's house for well over $40,000. The down payment was 80000 to the bank, Columbia Savings and Loans. So they were, and this was a house they got for $80,000. And it was valued at probably 125000 150000 Back in so 1975, right, yeah. Sure, they were already ahead in this, if you look at it. He had a very successful business, contrary to what you've heard. It was uh, William H. Perry, Inc. It had been his grandfather's. It was established in 1917, I believe. And um, it was the only type of surveying business in New York that was doing the type of work that they did at the time. So he was very successful at that. Well, let's let's take people back to, I mean, the story for, for George and, and Kathy kind of started in the summer of 75, right, when they bought the house and they moved in. Leading up to it, you know, we've heard about the DeFeo murders. Were there right. any claims of, of haunting or strange stuff that happened at that time that led to Ronnie, other than just the, the claims that they used in court later on? Sure. Um, Ronald DeFeo has made endless statements over the years since this happened about things that went on in the House. Later, he recanted them, saying, well, that was just, you know, trying to cop an insanity plea for the trial. Well, years after the trial was over, in 1979, he said in an interview with Hans Holzer, that they would hear noises in the house, people screaming, but there wasn't nobody screaming, um, that paintings and objects would move around the house from the first floor up to the third floor, ghosts, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the Was there any kind, of, uh, any kind of <clears throat> research done on the house prior to them? I mean, is there, what, what is this? Is this the old ancient Indian burial ground theory that we got in Poltergeist? Or what? why would this land be so wrought with, well, with haunting? Well, a lot of people have made a lot of various claims. They, a lot of people investigated the house. Mm-hmm. Lorraine and Ed Warren, uh, their prognosis was that it was demonic and that it couldn't be fixed. That's why George and Kathy left the house. Hans Holter came in later on and investigated the house with a psychic medium, Ethel Johnson Myers, and their conclusion, because Hans Holter, you have to remember, is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God mm-hmm. and those types of things. So their their prognosis or diagnosis of what happened was that it was an Indian burial ground that was there, that there was a, an Indian chief whose grave was defiled, and that it was the Indian chief causing all the ruckus inside the house. And other people have made other claims. Well, so, isn't there a way to go back historically and actually find this so it's not just claims? It's Well, sure. The Amityville Historical Society, that house was built in 1928. There was an original house that was on the property that belonged to Patrick J. Moynihan. The Moynihans wanted a bigger house for a bigger family, so they moved that house a few blocks away and lived in it while the Dutch Colonial was built around 1924, 1928. At that point, they moved into that home, and the Amityville Historical Society, from what George told me, had all kinds of documents that related to um, the history of Indians living on the property and um, all sorts of things like that. When the movie came out, all of that stuff got spirited away, and it disappeared from the archives. Yet Laura DeDeo, who was a uh, news reporter for the local um, news station up there still has that documentation, and I have copies of it as well. So does Hans Holzer. So there is there is evidence that shows that Indians did live on the property and around the property at the time, but um, it's hard to come by for some reason these days. Well, I wouldn't think that'd be too hard to to research just in you know <clears throat> sure. Indian Indian heritage and lore, knowing what was going on out there. So sure. So this happened. Now, what happened with? Ronnie DeFeo. I mean, what's the story of the murder? And, and, you know, there's been so much speculation and, you know, disinformation given by both Ronnie and his attorneys and and other people looking to make a buck. What do you know or understand to be true about what actually occurred the night Ronnie DeFeo Jr. killed his family? Well, let's look at the evidence that we have available to us. If you look at the original crime scene photographs, you'll see that there were statues that were placed all around the property. They had statues inside the home and outside the home. 
and they had built these huge concrete paths for them. And there were religious statues, statues of the Holy Family, and they were placed on the property about six months before the murders took place. And it was always George's belief that the DeFeos knew that something was wrong with the house. I mean, you know, we talk about violent hauntings and what attracts these violent hauntings to a family. And there was a lot of dysfunction with that family. Big Ronnie DeFeo Sr. was a very abusive husband. He was abusive to the kids. It's all well documented. And something happened about six months before the murders took place that caused him to become very religious. He went to Canada. He had these statues made, brought them back, and placed them on the property. And neighbors would suddenly see this big guy um, out saying a rosary to a statue of St. Joseph on his lawn in the morning. People who would ask him what happened or what's going on with all the religious stuff, he would answer them with phrases like, I have the devil on my back. And some people say he was referring to his son. Some people say he was referring to something else. So <clears throat> the fact that these religious statues were there kind of showed that something was going on with the family before this. And then on November 13th, 1974, the murders took place. And eight rifle shots with a 36 caliber Marlin rifle, or a 35 caliber, I'm not sure, Marlin rifle, went through the house that night. Ronald moved from room to room. He killed all of his uh, brothers and sisters and his family. No one seemed to hear the gunshots because nobody moved out of bed. They were all in the almost the exact same position with arms extended and a right leg pulled up, almost like, uh, like there was somebody that helped um, and held them in bed when this happened. There were no evidence of drugs in their system, so they shouldn't have slept through this, but they did, apparently. Ronald DeFeo later testified in court that a female, some sort of an apparition with black hands, handed him the rifle that night. And that it wasn't like they were covered with gloves, but it was black like a void, like you hear um, Rosemary Ellen Guiley talk about shadow people, that type of thing. And that while he moved from room to room, he heard voices telling him to commit the murders. And then he saw these shadowy figures that were moving from room to room that night. So that came out in court testimony, and George had nothing to do with that, <laughs> you right. know. Um, well, let's, let's take our second break here. When we come back, we'll kind of go from where the story takes off then. You're listening sure. to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show with our guest, Mr. Tim Yancey. For more information on Tim, go to his website at www.encounterslive.com. You can also check out the other two websites that he's run, which is uh, AmityvilleHorror.com, that's AmityvilleHorror.com, and AmityvilleTruth.com, I believe is the other one. So check those websites out. We'll be back with more right after this. Director's Log. I can't believe I'm with these Darkness Radio dorks again. It's like having bamboo shoved underneath my fingernails. Please, somebody shoot me. Don't you dare move. There's more to come from the darkness on the edge of town with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis. If you bleed from the ears while listening to Leo Sayer Records, would it qualify as a paranormal experience? I thought so. Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town. Ooh, that hurts. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio. And our guest this evening is Mr. Tim Yancey, a host of Encounters. Uh, and Tim, we're talking about the Amityville Horror Case. And the yep. research that you've done, uh, it seems like you know your stuff. You've, you've moved along through this pretty well. And, again, people can check out the websites, AmityvilleHorror.com, and uh, the other side is AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, correct? Right. Okay. Right. And they can follow along. And you've got a, a great collection of information there that you've put together that show very specifically some of the things to back up all of the cases and the stories that are being said and, and shared out there. Now, let's talk about some of the stranger um, if you will, you know, parts of the of the story. Okay. You know, flying pigs, bleeding walls, <laughs> flies, a priest that slapped around and, and you know, um, you, you know, while trying to do the blessing for the house. What right. can we what can we differentiate? What's true, what's not, and is there somewhere in the middle that, that you found that is a a better representation of all the different stories? Well, we'll go down the list. We'll start with uh, the pig, the flying pig. Um over the time that George and Kathy were in the house, um, Missy began acting a little strangely 
um, they began to notice that she would be in her room singing, for instance, and as she walked out of the door of her room, she would stop singing. And she would go down the hall, do whatever she was going to do, and when she'd come back, she would begin singing again, uh, right where she picked up at. She came down to Kathy one day, and she said, Mommy, do angels talk? And Kathy said, well, yeah, I guess so. Why? And they discovered that she had what they thought was an imaginary friend, and its name was Jody. And Jody had the ability to appear to her as a uh, pig, a very large pig, sometimes as big as the whole house, or a very small pig, um, a little boy. Uh, he would manifest to different people in different ways. And they found out over the years that Jody wasn't so much um, imagination. Uh, he would make statements to Missy that uh, she was going to live there in that house forever. And so they began becoming a little disturbed about <clears throat> this apparition that they called Jody. Um, there was an incident where, in fact, several times while they were there, that they would be sitting on the couch in the living room or at the window upstairs in Missy's room and see eyes peering into the room. Or George was coming back from the boathouse uh, one time, again at night. The door would always open in the middle of the night down at the boathouse. And he'd have to go out there and shut the thing. And on the way back, he saw a form in Missy's room that night. It was a human-shaped form. Ran upstairs, went into her room. She was right there asleep, and, of course, nobody was in the house. So that's where, where Jody came from. So this levitating demonic pig, it used to hang outside her window and watch her, or did anybody else ever see the pig? I know James Brolin in, in the first movie you know, would see the glowing red eyes outside the, <laughs> the window right. and the squeals. Was that ever an actual part of their history and story? Yeah, uh, George did see that coming back from the boathouse. That was added into the movie. It was pretty accurate. Um, the babysitter scene, you may recall in the movie there was a babysitter who got trapped in the closet type of thing. It was kind of like that, but not exactly right. Um, he, George had an aunt who came to the house and stayed, and she also saw a little boy in Missy's room. But he wasn't like the ghosty boy photo that you may have heard about or you may have seen in the presentations. It was a little boy, but he was blue. Um, and that's, that story turned into the babysitter type of thing. Um, now, let's there, talk about that picture, too. Now, if people Google it <clears throat> or look around on enough of the websites, and I don't mm -hmm. know, do, do you guys have it up on your site? or I'm No, we don't. Um, oh, you know what? If, if you go to, uh, here, here's a website for people that would like to see the picture of the ghost boy. Um, and please bear with me. I'll spell it out for you. It's S K E. P D I C dot com slash haunted dot H T M L. Again, that's S K E P D I C dot com slash haunted dot H T M L. There is a very clear representation of the photograph there. What do you know about that photograph that was shown? I mean, according to the story here, is it said that uh, that uh, the photograph was taken um, with was it Ed and Lorraine Warren? Uh, yeah. They did an infrared time-lapse photography, and there seems to be a boy with uh, these kind of glowing eyes staring, in the foot case, uh, or sure. staring at the foot of a staircase. And that was actually shown on the Merv Griffin show, it says here, as well. Right, right, it was. They had a photographer who developed their photography, as an, uh, their photographs and pictures. His name was Gene Campbell, and he had always wanted to go on an investigation. So when Amityville came around, he went with them. And he set up a camera on a tripod on the landing there, and it was an infrared photo, and it was set up on a timer kind of thing where it would just randomly shoot pictures through the night. And <clears throat> the strange thing about the photograph there was that it doesn't match anybody who was uh, present at the time. It appears to be a young boy um, leaning out of the staircase. He seems to be wearing pajamas of some sort. And um, I've, I've been through all of the photographs that were taken that night and everybody that was there, and I can't find anybody that that photograph matches to. Um, there's an even stranger picture that was taken that night of a cameraman. You'll see um, Marvin Scott holding a microphone with a cameraman and a lighting guy behind him. And everybody's hands are present and, and accounted for, but there's a third hand 
up on the camera that nobody can explain. So, yeah, there were a few um, strange photographs that were taken that night. Now, it wasn't the photograph of the little boy. Don't they claim that there was nobody on site for it, but the little boy does have a resemblance to one of the DeFeo children? Apparently so. Um, If you take the name Jody, which we were talking about the flying pig earlier, and take one of the children who lived there when the DeFeos were there, John DeFeo, the first two letters of, of the name would be Joe D. And so Scotty G., who worked with the History Channel on the Histories and Mysteries segment, matched up the photographs of John DeFeo and this child that's in the Ghosty Boy photograph, and the resemblances are pretty striking, actually. Now, is this, uh, could it also be, I'm just looking at the picture here, now, I've heard the the debate that it isn't like glowing eyes, but it almost looks like the kid is wearing glasses and it's just a reflection off the lens. Yes. Um, I have a very high-resolution picture of the ghosty boy, and it does appear to be glasses that he's wearing and a reflection. That That is true. Um, if you ask me, I'd say he was wearing glasses. All right. And, you know, I know we're going to get, uh, I'm going to be remiss if I don't ask this, I have about a minute, minute and a half here before we go to the top of the hour break. But, okay. Uh, we talked about the fact now in the movies it looks like their house is just kind of this isolated little house on a on a beautiful little uh hill and it's nowhere near anything and in reality the houses are are very close to each other aren't they uh, they are they're very close so together how did neighbors you know i m- my neighbors in my in the houses that have been on the other sides of me i can hear when they slam their front door how can <laughs> you not hear eight shotgun sounds or rifle sounds go off in a house that nobody ever heard at night well, these are the things that confuse the Amityville Police Department as well. They, um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff out there, especially the new movie. It has some special features, and in one of them, the police chief and the people, the coroner who investigated the murders, they were stumped by that. They had no idea how nobody heard the gunshots, how nobody in the house even woke up uh, hearing the different shots that were fired. And um, it's, it's just a mystery that still lingers. And even the mother and father were laying side by side. They looked like they hadn't been disturbed. And how did one not react to the sound of the gunshot for the other, correct? That's true. That very, is true. Very bizarre. I, I have never come to understand that. There was some evidence in the trial that showed that one of the girls may have awakened and opened her eyes because they found unburned gunpowder particles in her eyes. But you have to remember that she was shot at point blank in the face and <laughs> unburned gunpowder particles... That, in her eyelids could have been a result of such a high impact uh, at such a close rate. So it, it's one of the mysteries of the fail murders that, that still stands to this day. Well, Tim, stick with us. We're going to be back after the top of the hour. Can you hang with us for a little bit more and talk more? Sure. All right, sure. we'll be back with more with Tim Yancey. And again, if you'd like more information, you can check out Tim's websites, AmityvilleHorror.com, AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, or you can check him out directly at his website for Encounters. And uh, check that information out, get yourself ready, and we'll be back with more, and we'll take more of your questions right after this. We hope you're enjoying today's special throwback episode in memoriam for our good friend, Tim Yancey. Stay tuned. There's much more to hear about Amityville right after this. Welcome back to the program. This is Darkness Radio, and today we are dipping into the archives, back to 2008, visiting with our friend Tim Yancey. Tim, unfortunately, lost his battle with cancer this week and was taken from us all too soon. We're very pleased to have known Tim and have been friends with Tim personally and professionally. And this was the very first interview that we did with Tim Yancey regarding Amityville Horror. We'll continue that right now. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free 
and things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. And welcome back to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Remember to spend your Sunday nights listening to the best in paranormal radio, and now you can enlarge that by going to EncountersLive.com the hour before our show and listening and sharing your time with Tim Yancey and his lovely wife Trish as they take you through the paranormal. Uh, Their show can be heard by going to EncountersLive.com. If you're out in the Florida area, you can check Clear Channel's WBZT, 1230 a.m. for the uh, live show and the streaming again at EncountersLive.com with uh, Tim Yancey and Trish. And uh, you've also got Jason Gowan joining you on the uh, show, Tim. Is that right? That's true. Um, Jason is a guy that I've been trying to get down here for about a year now to join us on the radio show. Uh, Just a really funny guy, a very passionate investigator, dedicated to what he does, and uh, it's a real new dynamic for the show. It's, it's been a lot of fun having him on board with us. Good deal. So people can check that out. Again, if you're tuning in right now, we're talking about the Amityville Horror Case, trying to separate some of the fact from fiction, and uh, Tim runs two websites. Um, one is called AmityvilleHorror.com. The other one is AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com. And you said now you've pretty much you, you've set those up and you've just left them alone since the passing of uh, George Lutz last May. Right. Um, George actually called me on my birthday one day, and he says, Hey, kid, guess what? I got you a present. And I said, Really? What's that? And he says, um, I got you AmityvilleHard.com for your birthday. And I said, What do you mean? He says, Well, you're going to be my new webmaster. <laughs> so um, I was like, Okay, well, that's a lot of work, but thanks, George. You know? <laughs> hey, and Tim, now we know how to do things. For now on, if go. we have something we need done, hey, that's Tim. Right. We got you a <laughs> <Happy> present. <birthday>. <laughs> <laughs> I bought you a sponge in a bucket. There's my car. Start washing. There you go. <laughs> it works. All right. <laughs> but uh, that that began um, the two of us working uh, on the website, and he would send information over that he thought was important that he wanted to put up there. And we were in the process of putting the final touches on it, unfortunately, when he passed away. And so it was something that I just kind of couldn't bring myself to change after his passing and so it's it's still there and it's still set the way that uh it was the day he passed away and george was a dear friend he he taught me more about the paranormal than i had learned in 35 years previous to meeting the guy and he was somebody that that meant a lot to me and so you know the least that i can do is keep that up there in in his honor all right very cool people can check that out and uh, I, I will tell you, I've had the chance to see and, and uh, be along Tim uh, Yancey here for a couple of different events. He's a great guy, great speaker, and he has a great show. So I hope that the, the listeners and friends of Darkness Radio will uh, open their hearts and arms and, and give a listen to Encounters Live every Sunday night before you come over to us and uh, be a part of the, uh, the atmosphere so you can have a full night of investigative uh, information on all different forms of the paranormal. Well, I, I appreciate that, and, and I do have to say thank you for allowing me to come on to your show. You know, you, you are a heavyweight in the paranormal world. You are a huge... Hey, be careful. There, I'm so trying to speak. lose weight, all right? Daddy, <laughs> Daddy, <laughs> well, well, it's four. true. I mean, <laughs> you know, Dave Schrader and Darkness Radio has a huge impact on the paranormal community, and I appreciate the fact that you um, chose to let me come on. And I, and I do have to tell you, Dave, I, I will make this publicly known. When I signed on with Clear Channel to do the show that we do, I had it put into our contract that we would not be competing in the same time slot as you. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was no way I was going up against Darkness Dave, boy. Well, very, very uh, much appreciated. Thank you for saying that. That's uh, very flattering. Uh, it's completely <laughs> insane, but very flattering. And, I, <laughs> and I'm sure all 12 of my listeners are thankful, too, that uh, they don't have to split their time between you and I now. So uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, it's a good lineup, if you think about it. On Sundays, you have Ghostly Talk. That's right. Then you have Encounters, and then you have Darkness Dave. And then at night, if you can get on Clear Channel, you've got George Norrie. So it's, uh, Sundays is a great night for Paranormal Radio. That's funny, Ed, and that's what when Tim and I started with this show, we said, uh, you know, even though uh, Coast to Coast is on, you know, 
a different network than we were, we didn't want to compete with Coast to Coast. So no even, though, even though we had a local flair, so we lead up to, so it's been nice now, everybody, we've got this strong fit, so you can do Ghostly Talk early, go to Tim yeah. Yancey, then go to Darkness Radio, and then roll over. So for those of you people that really have no life or living in your mom's basement, you now have <laughs> six to eight hours of paranormal talk you could tune into. Uh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and, and the fun part of it is that we're all friends, yeah. you know, and, and it's not a competitive thing. And, you know, Scott and Doug are great people, and I love seeing them at conferences as well as you and Tim and uh, everybody else. So yeah. it, it's always fun. And that's I thank you for letting us on. Oh, not a problem. We uh, we enjoy having it. And, we you know, we've always been about sharing and, and having other shows on our show. I think we've had sure. Ghostly Talk, Todd, uh, yourself, other radio show hosts that have come on the show with us and talked so uh, yeah, I'm. You know, it's great that uh, the community can be this open and and share. I think when you start getting into the ego issues, that's why there's so many wars. And if people could see that yeah. groups like us, who are in competition in a sense for listeners, can get along, and there's not this war, there maybe people can start to, you know, peg it down a little bit in the whole investigative side of things, where it's really getting ugly out there. I, I agree. You know, I mean, there are people at conferences that I can start talking about Amityville that just hate it. They're convinced it's a hoax, <laughs> you know, at, but at the end of the day, we can still continue to be friends. And, and that's important in this community. I mean, there's enough garbage and conflict swirling around out there in the paranormal community without, you know, all that little ego stuff getting in the way. So, so it's really good stuff when we go to conferences and get to meet people like you, man. Well, thank you. Now, I'm looking at one of the sites that talks about the hoax that is the real Amityville horror. And okay. uh, as we're going through some of these points that they're bringing up, they're saying that you, you'd mentioned the pit to hell located in the basement. And they're saying right. that uh, these are things that were definitely quoted coming from uh, the Lutzes. It says, after living in the house for just 10 days, the Lutzes suddenly abandoned all their possessions, moved out of their beloved new home. They quickly went public and told of their horrors that tormented them in the house. The horrors they spoke of included levitating demonic pigs, ghostly voices that told them and the local priest to get out, a pit to hell in the located in the basement, oozing slime and blood from the walls, uncontrollable urges to repeat the murders that had happened in the house previously, infestations of flies, waking up every night at the exact time that the DeFeo murders took place. Now, okay. of those points, are, are any of them true, and which ones? Well, if I can remember the list here, sure. George did state that he would usually wake up uh, in the middle of the night. He would wake up usually uh, between 3 and 3.30, sometime around there, usually about 3.15 or so. And he would have this urge to just get up and wander around the house. Uh, I told you about the boathouse door out there. Right. It, it had this problem where it would always be open, and he'd have to go down there and close the thing. And that was one of the reasons for his nightly escapades. Now, just, he, now to look at it from a skeptical <clears throat> side here, Tim, um, and tell me what your thoughts are on this. You know, we've had our good friend Adam Bly on the show, who's a demonologist. He's also, sure. you know, uh, works in the psychological field and talks to us about sleep patterns and things that, you know, people mistake as paranormal activity, which is not. Right. And reading and doing some of the things, people sleep in four-hour sleep patterns, where okay. it's four hours of steady sleep, and then, you know, usually that's why you get eight hours. It's, it's, it's a good time frame. Usually you sleep in four-hour chunks. So, you know, it could just depend on what time he went to bed that as he came out of it, he was just a little bit more sensitive that he continually broke out of that sleep shell at around the same time. I also know that once you start getting into a routine, I can't tell you, I don't use an alarm clock 95% of the time. Um, yeah, I know I got to be up at nine o'clock in the morning. I go to bed at, uh, whether I go to bed at nine o'clock at night or four o'clock in the morning, I wake up at 9am because right. I've, you know, I don't know if I've trained my internal clock or or what's going on but i I seem to wake up and i notice that once that happens i start falling into the pattern and i notice it now does that mean that at 11 22 every night i just happen to roll over and look at the clock and it's 11 22 or do i notice it because that's my birthday november 22nd and do i look at the clock a thousand times a day i just don't pay attention to it because the (laughs) numbers mean nothing to me so right well george always said that there came a time when him and the family had to stop blaming everything on the house. Right. <laughs> and I think that this may have been one of those incidences. It was a case where he would awaken in the middle of the night, have a cigarette, go to bed, would do whatever, wander around the house. Um, it was just another thing uh, among many things. See, and there's another the, great point. If he's having a cigarette, sometimes the body cravings make you get up. And then, <laughs> then if there's another pattern that he's noticed is that the door's always open around that time. Right. His body is just, you know, geared to get up, have a smoke, go close the door, and come back to bed. Sure. 
Sure, it's a, it's a complete possibility. The other things that would happen that would wake him from a sleep were things like, he described it as an unorganized musical sound. This became the marching band that you'd heard about in the book and right. in various stories. It sounded almost to him like a clock radio that was off channel would going off and he would hear it from downstairs and he'd go downstairs and look for the sound and there'd be nothing there but the carpet would be rolled back in the uh in the living room there things like that were were a lot of the catalysts for him waking up in the middle of the night they did hear screams and voices inside the house um you mentioned ralph pecoraro who was the priest that that went into the house father pecoraro was a judge with the ecclesiastical court with the rockville center diocese there he spoke several languages he was uh, not the kind of person that would normally go and bless a person's house but he was friends with george um he had helped him with an annulment from george's first marriage and they had become friends and talked over the phone several times and when a friend that george built motorcycles with by the name of tommy um heard the house that they were getting he really demanded that they have the house blessed and he didn't know who to call he um he wasn't a practicing um religious person he was i believe episcopalian at the time but um he called father ralph pecoraro and he agreed to do that when he came into the house <clears throat> he testified later and there are interviews on in search of that you can find with father ralph pecoraro talking about this that when he went into the house, George was unloading boxes. They kind of waved at each other. Father Ralph went into the house, and he said the one room, the sewing room, which was considered the worst room in the house, was very cold. And he thought that it was unusual, and that uh, he began blessing the sewing room, and he heard a voice tell him to get out of the house, and that he was slapped across the face, and that there was nobody there. Now, George and Kathy didn't know this at the time. When he came back down, all he said was that he was uncomfortable about a certain room in the house, um, the sewing room, and that he would prefer that, you know, they didn't use it as a bedroom. Now, George and Kathy didn't under, really understand what he was saying, but they said that they were going to use it as a sewing room, and he seemed to be comfortable with that. And uh, they tried to give him, a, I think it was a bottle of wine or something like that as a gift, but he wouldn't have it. You know, um, they were friends. So he uh, left, and it was only later in the Jay Anson interviews that that actually came out. And eventually it came out in testimony as well. So there was some legitimacy in this priest. I know they've interviewed him. Was it on sightings or one of those shows where they had him come back? And, and right. he actually admitted that he did hear the word get out. It was, that's not just a fallacy that has been perpetrated well, sure. since the event. Sure. Uh, this affected his life in so many ways. He eventually left the diocese. He was transferred here and there. And the last anyone heard, they believe that he may have passed away here in Florida in 1981. But it, it was something that affected him uh, very deeply. In the book, he was portrayed as Father Mancuso, and they tried for a long time to hide his identity. So a lot of people like Stephen Kaplan, who wrote the Amityville Conspiracy books, and Joel right. Martin, and some of them uh, came out and said that he never existed. Well, he did. Wow. All right. So we've got that down. Now, l let me ask you this, too. What did George think? I mean, I'm sure you talked to him about this. Did they have any trepidation about buying a house where all these brutal murders took place? Well, sure. Um, Edith Evans, who was the realtor that had been showing them houses over the suburb, told him, well, I want to show you a house, let's show you how the other half of Amityville lives. And she took him to the house at 112 Ocean Avenue, and they toured it as a family. And she said, well, look, I don't know if I should have told you this before or after uh, touring the house, but this is a DeFeo house. And they're like, what, were you, what do you mean? And she reminded them of the murders that had occurred 13 months before. And they had, he explained to me that they had several discussions as a family about whether or not to move into the house. Um, some of the possessions that were inside the house still belonged to the DeFeos, and it went with the property. And George said, you know, it, it was good stuff. They had good stuff. <laughs> and so right. um, after several discussions with the kids and with Kathy and everybody, they decided that it wasn't going to be a problem for them. He was not a believer in the paranormal stuff. The only there have been there have been a lot of people that said over the years that he was into the occult and he was a Satan worshiper and this and that. 
His explanation to me was the only thing that they had done before moving into the house was they had taken some TM classes, which was Transcendental Meditation, meditating classes that were real big in the 70s. And they had been involved in that, and, and that was it. Uh, unless you count playing around with an Ouija board a couple times as a teen. But that was the extent of anything that he knew about the paranormal, and so that they didn't think that it was going to be a problem, and they agreed to buy the house. All right. So they've, they've gone ahead, they've purchased this house, they had no real fears or worry that it was going to be haunted by ghosts. Because, again, right. who's going to think of that? You know, you're, you, you right. know, now, yeah, maybe, because of, uh, you know, how, how the Pandora's box has been opened and everybody thinks everything is paranormal now. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, it wasn't a precursor for most of these people. It was able, you were able to, you know, just, oh, yeah, it's a real problem that somebody was murdered there but we moved in right. and, you know got a deal and as you mentioned they bought an eighty thousand dollar home that was estimated to be valued at 120 so they were making money on the deal when sure. they, did they ever end up reselling the house or did they just bail out and you know it went into foreclosure what happened with that at some point after the investigation that ed and lorraine warren did ed and lorraine sat down with george and kathy and they said look this is something that we cannot fix um <clears throat> it's malevolent. We believe that it's demonic, and it's not something that we can fix without having priests come in and do some sort of a blessing or rituals over the home. George saw that, the way he explained it to me, as putting someone's life in danger. So they decided that they, they couldn't do that, but what they could do was give the house back to the bank. Now, originally, the, the plan was to move out, get the house fixed, and move back in. They had never planned on originally selling the home. And if you look, you will find that they eventually turned the house back over to the bank, but it wasn't for several months later. In uh, July or August of the next year, they continued to make payments on that house, hoping that they could get it fixed. And once Ed and Lorraine sat them down and said, you know, this is the case, this is what we think, they decided to move as far away as they could. They moved across the country to California. Uh, When they got to the airport, he had had a cedar chest that they told him was okay to take out because cedar is, according to the Warrens, there was something about the cedar wood that made it okay to bring out. And I'm, I've never understood it myself, but he got a trunk and a motorcycle and some blue boat towels that were in the van. He had some uh, boat towels that he uses, and he took those, went to the airport, dropped it off. The guy that took their luggage, he handed them the keys for the van and said, here you go, we're not coming back, and off they went to California. So for George, it was something, especially with the last night that they spent in the house, that he realized he couldn't fix this, and he didn't have control over this, and he didn't understand it. And after seeking out the best expert that he could find and them saying we can't do nothing, it was time to go. Well, now, on the other side, let's look at it skeptically again here. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and we've heard this story forever. People say, hey, if you want to hit it big and you want to do something, California is the place you ought to be. Uh, So they loaded up the truck and moved to Beverly, I guess. But uh, seriously, you know, okay, now we've just made this big story. We've we've got the public attention. Probably the best place for us to live is California, (laughs) so when we can sell the movie rights... Do you feel that there was any, I mean, do you, can you see how that would lend itself to the skeptics I, and, and their beliefs? Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. They moved, I can't remember the name of the town they moved right off the top of my head in California, but it wasn't like they went to Hollywood or somewhere like that. Uh, it, was a, it was a small town. I can't remember quite the name of it. They moved there, and you have to remember that the book didn't come out until 1979. Uh, the movies didn't come out until... Uh, later than that. So we're talking about uh, from 75 to 79, they moved out there. Um, I, I I can't say that that move was based on the fact that they were going to be rich immediately. I mean, it was four years in the making before they even had a book published. Sure. All right. Now, how about the fact that there's some inconsistencies? Uh, the Lutzes changed their story uh, a few times. Uh, originally, they said that they lived in the house for 28 days, and then it became, uh, you know, originally it was 10 days, and then it was that it was that they actually lived there for 28 days. What's with the inconsistency with the, the move on? That? I have never heard uh, George Lutz or any of the family members ever say anything other than 28 days. So where the 10 days comes from, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> don't know. Do you think that it, a, that a lot of what happened? Do you, do you believe that a lot of what happened at Amityville and a lot of what happened with the story 
was just kind of blown out of control for the Lutzes by the media? And because it was just a sensational story to tell? I think it was. And I think that what happened was also was that there were a lot... Let's, let's face it, Amityville is probably the most famous haunting case in history. It's also one of the most controversial because there have been people who have gone in, tried to debunk it, or insert themselves as some sort of an authority over the subject. They didn't live there. They, many of them have never been to the house or interviewed the family at any length at all. Many of them have never met the Lutzes. But they would tell you what happened. <clears throat> so, I don't know. Stephen Kaplan was one of the gentlemen who first came out along with Joel Martin as the people that debunked the Amityville Heart. He wrote a book called The Amityville Horror Conspiracy. Yeah, and, and let's cover that in a minute. We, Tim's signaling me from okay. across the board. We have to take a break. Yeah, I want to talk about Mr. Kaplan and his attacks then on the Luxes and, or Lutzes and going forward. So stay okay. tuned. You're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town with our guest, Tim Yancey. And again, check out his website at uh, AmityvilleHorror.com and AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com. And check out his radio show every Sunday night leading up to ours at www.EncountersLive.com. We thought El Chupacabra meant the cup of coffee in Spanish. Mi amo Eduardo Especial. Como esta el yay? What you talking about, Willis? Shows you what we know. Stay tuned. There's more to come from the darkness on the edge of town. In the Amityville Horror, the ghost told them to get out the house. White people stayed in there. Now that's a hit and a half for your <laughs> A ghost say get the f*** out, I would just tip the f*** out the door. They walked and looked in the toilet bowl with blood in the toilet. They said, that's peculiar. <laughs> I would have been in the house and said, oh, baby, this is beautiful. We got a chandelier hanging up here, kids outside playing. It's a beautiful neighborhood. We ain't got nothing to wear. I really love them. This is really nice. <laughs> Too bad we can't stay, baby. We're the type of guys who would have stayed just for the extra company. Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town. And welcome back to the show. Our guest this evening, Mr. Tim Yancey. We're talking about the Amityville Horror Case, and we're getting in depth a little bit here, talking about some of the fact and fiction. Let me ask you now. First of all, is it is it true, Tim? Have they actually changed the physical address? It's no longer one twelve Ocean Avenue. That's true. Um, because so much publicity came out with the movies and all, they uh, have remodeled the house. The uh, real famous eye shaped windows aren't there anymore. I hear and, that they've uh, actually they relocate the address. They're putting them back, from what I've been told. A possibility. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, uh, people are all wondering where those windows went, and we tried to keep track of them over the years, but but lost track of them and have no idea where they are now. You know, it's really funny. I don't mean that they're putting the originals in; that they're that they're putting in new windows that look like the eyes. Is what I've been told that they are oh, updating okay. that. But um, you know, I I think it's so funny. Are the families that have moved there since knowing the house and knowing the history, and right. then they get so frustrated and angry. Well, you bought the flippin' Amityville Horror House, Kate, you know. <laughs> if you don't <laughs> yeah, expect people true. to come by and take photographs, then buy the house next to the Amityville Horror House. You don't buy <laughs> the Amityville Horror House. That's, uh, That's true. Um, what do you, what do you think of... The a gentleman named Brian Wilson, who... Uh, was with the Beach Boys. That's great. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish. Yeah. But, um, and no, he, over the years, has had to deal with a lot of the garbage of people coming through and sightseeing and this and that. And, and you're right. It makes no sense to me why you would want to buy that house to begin with if you're if you're you know not into paranormal investigations by any means but well, even that but how can you buy a, <clears throat> a, a world famous it'd be like me going and buying abraham lincoln's you know birth home and then being pissed if people come by because they want to see abraham lincoln's <laughs> birth home you know That's what true. you've got a very famous place you know oh yeah i bought the white house but sh all these people <laughs> that keep coming by to want to see it because presidents lived here yeah. what the hell's wrong with these people you know, yeah. what, uh, my question is, what the hell's wrong with a goofball that buys the house? Now, how come there has been no real reported activity in the Amityville house since the Lutzes left? I don't know. Um, I mean, probably, if there was no way that the Warrens could fix it, and their idea was just get the hell out. Right. I understand. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, there's so many cases out there that you hear of, like the Enfield Poltergeist case, uh, the Bell Witch Haunting, those kind of places that didn't have any activity after that family left either. And I have no explanation for that. I, I can tell you that George always thought that the Cromartys, who bought the house after they left, uh, that they probably had a life much worse than what happened 
uh, to the Lutzes. He, we have photographs of the Cromartys, who said for years that nothing had gone on in that place and took and poked quite a bit of fun at the Lutzes. Um, yet we have photographs that were taken for magazine articles and things that show their arms and parts of their bodies transparent. Um, there are taped interviews that have growls in them that George had copies of. So I don't know. Uh, the Cromartie's son died of a drug overdose while they lived there. So there, I don't know. There, there's a lot of tragedy that, that seems to go with the house. George called it like the most divorced house in America. Just about everybody that's ever lived there has had financial difficulties or divorces of some kind. And like I said, you can't blame everything on the house, but it's just another one of those things well, about you know, that's, Amityville. Yeah, that's interesting because we've been told, you know, a lot of homes where you're having fights with your spouse and they don't <clears> seem <throat> to be over really anything, it, it's the, the, the spirits like to muck with you and get that heightened sense because they can live off that energy sure. and draw off of it. That's why a lot of spirits will hang around in bars or in uh, places where there's a lot of energy and activity so that they can kind of live vicariously through us and the energy that they throw. Um, sure. You know, be it sexual energy, tension, angry, drunk, whatever, you've got all this different energy just zipping around. So I, I do find it interesting, you know, so many people in the paranormal field, even if they're both into the paranormal, end up divorced as well. Uh, dealing with this, and it, it always seems to be about uh, rage or anger issues. Um, yeah, I don't know that. It, it, I, I would think that's something that's a little bit more frightening to me than malevolent, you know, throwing plates at my head. Spirits is the spirits that are <laughs> mucking with your life, and you know, marriage is hard enough. I don't have to worry about Uncle Jed screwing with me to you know live off my essence. <clears throat> that's true. You know, I, I have found in my personal experience and in researching others that. This stuff has a way of attacking you in ways that you would never even think of. And when I thought that I was at a place where, okay, I'm done with this, I mean, I had made a conscious decision and a conscious choice in my life that this stops here and it stops now and had started working on that. Next thing I know, I'm thinking everything's okay and my mom is going through pure hell where something is is affecting her life or my brother or somebody like that. And I left Paranormal Radio. You know, I was doing this back in 1994, and I left Paranormal Radio for five years because I couldn't have this stuff attacking my family. And I thought that maybe my interest in Paranormal Radio and the stuff I was doing was, was having an effect on all of that. So it, it is, Dave. It's something that I think that we as humans will probably never understand fully. We'll never figure out the ways that it can influence your life. And... It's an ongoing mystery for me to this day, you know? Strange. Now, you had mentioned at the beginning of the show, too, that there are things you can do to arm yourselves and protect yourselves from this. Let's let's talk sure. about some of that, and then we'll go back into some more of the Amityville lies and, and truths and, and see what you can okay. separate for us. But let's give some people, real quick, before we end up at the end of the show out of time, what can people do besides add laughter and love into their lives to change things? I you know, because to, to people like myself, it comes off sounding so hippie. You know, oh, laughter yeah. will keep the spirits at bay. Well, to me, again, if they can live off energy, why can't they live off of a euphoric energy as well? Yeah. Well, I think that, Dave, you have, uh, have had experiences in your life and in your investigations as well. So you know where I'm coming from with this, I, I believe. Um, I, I made a decision a long time ago because of this haunting stuff that was happening you know for a long time i was embarrassed to say that i was a haunting survivor or a haunting victim whatever you choose to call it and at a point when you're six seven ten twelve years old and this stuff is going on in your life bad things are happening to you and i thought that i was a bad kid that this this was a punishment of some kind that I had done something wrong and I was bad and growing up in my teen years I decided you know what yes if I'm bad I'm going to be the baddest dude that I can be okay. <laughs> I'll show you right. and I traveled down some really dark roads through my life as a result of this stuff and I got to I, I got to a place you know for me it's not unusual to hear of somebody like Ronald DeFeo blowing away his entire family that's how this stuff affects you. It, it blurs the edges of reality and it makes you do things that aren't common, that aren't your personality. 
George and Kathy, the biggest thing that they talked about was how this house affected their personalities, how they got sick, how they lost weight. And George did hint during an Art Bell show that he had feelings and ideas and thoughts that would creep into his mind that bothered him, that worried him uh, for the safety of his family. And that's what I discovered as well. I went down some really nasty roads there for a long time. And it, it got to a point where if you're experiencing a violent haunting and something's going on, I think that you can wave all the sage and all the rosary beads and things around that you want. It's not going to make a difference until you make a conscious choice that this has to stop, and it stops here, and it stops now. Those things, that sage and that rosary beads and those things, they're helpful because they're kind of a placebo for right. me. Right. That's what I've it, always thought is it's more of an intent. As long yeah. as you're putting that out there and this is your intent is to remove whatever's in your right. home bothering you and your family. Sure. Those things are visual icons that I can visually look at and garner my positive energy around. But if you don't have that faith to start with, they're not going to do you any good. So that's where I had to start. I had to start believing in myself again, putting some positive stuff into my life. I talked about journaling. I mean, there were times when I would force myself to write, today I have a nice smile or something like that. Just positive affirmations and cram them in there and read them and remind yourself of that type of stuff. To reach out to friends and family members. You're having a bad day in your house, stuff's going on. Invite your friends over or go to your friend's house and surround yourself with that positive vibe and that energy that comes from them. Faith, for me, has played a big role. Um, I'm very active in our church. Trish is a Sunday school teacher where we go, my wife. And that's a huge help in this. And like I said, humor, that laughter. Let me ask you this, to, Tim. How do, I don't mean to cut you short on this, but now you say sure. your, your wife is a, a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. How do do they know what you're into, and how do they respond? See, it's funny. <clears throat> we My son would go to this... Um, nursery school here at a, a local church and i won't give the name but it's a a nice right. little nursery school but on the back of our window on my car and on her truck it says um you know explore the paranormal darkness radio dot right. com and the right. looks we got from churchgoers <laughs> of well, oh, well, it you're dealing with sure. sinners and satan i mean how do you do you, do you get the same kind of for me it's effect? a chance to to take those people that give you them funny looks and, and it's an a, a way to open a door into them and to make them understand that, hey, regardless of whether you believe it, this stuff is real or not, this is my reality and this is what happened to me. And through that, you know, it opens up conversation because this stuff isn't talked about. And that's why so many people think that, you know, okay, well, you were involved in hauntings and you know that Amityville guy, you must be demonic and you're one of those Satan worshipers and stuff demonologists all the time get a bad name because that's what people think they do. They don't realize that the role of a demonologist is not only to help people who are victims of this, they go in and do stuff. I know John Zappas, for example, he's gone in and infiltrated cults to pull members out for families, that type of thing. Um, <clears throat> it's a very different role than what most people think. But our church, I, I've invited Reverend Williamson, who is our pastor, on our show. He's been on four, five, six times. And we talk about that stuff. Um, if your God cannot accept the fact that maybe there's something in the world that, that you don't understand, you need to get a bigger God, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so. I'm I, yep, I can, I can see that point. <clears throat> let's let's uh, talk. So, uh, do you believe that uh, holy water, uh, crucifixes, all the stuff mm -hmm. is good things to add to your home, or do you think again it's it's more the placebo effect and it's just taking control of your life again and, and having it, uh, you know, I, booting out what doesn't belong there? I think that it depends on your faith. Um, for me, those things. There are things that I have. George gave me a. Uh, uh, a medallion, a little holy medallion that has a patch from uh, Padre Pio's tombstone that was touched to his tombstone. And it's just a little Catholic medallion. It's, it's nothing big. But for me, it's a visual tool, so to speak. It's a little visual thing that I can hold in my hand. And, you know, you can't always see or feel God. And with this, it brings me a little closer to that and to my faith. And that's good stuff. Um, that's fine. 
No problem with that. Holy water, if you have faith in it and you believe it works, and it's something that's, that's cool for you, no problem, by all means. Um, that's really what I think about it. That, that's why I think you hear so much of this stuff happening and it doesn't work. Um, it, it's, it's something that you have to have devotion to in your faith and, and have belief in, and that's what gives it power. Well, here, and here's something interesting, because I always get this question offline and off air. People want to know why holy water is better than a lot of other things. Holy water, aside being blessed water by a priest, holy water is also mixed with um, blessed salt. So what okay. happens is when you when you sprinkle the doorways and make the crucifix on the doors or you know the, the sign of the cross on the doors and windows <clears throat> and, and things in your home, when it dries, it leaves that salty residue, which is continued right. protection. So True. that's something for people that you know if you want to understand why uh, holy water seems to be so good is because as it dries, it also still leaves behind protection right. for you. Um, right. So that that's something to consider. Well, no. This stuff, this stuff, Dave, is a violation. It's very akin to an abuse, just like anything else: drug abuse, family abuse, husband abuse, those types of things. You go to an Al-Anon meeting and they give you a chip. You know, that's that's nothing. It doesn't have any special power in it. It's just a visual cue that you can kind of wrap yourself around and, and get your head straight with. Right. And that's that's how I think that stuff works. Uh, let's talk about a couple of these other things now. Do you think that a lot of the case was, you know, a, a good case, but it, it just pissed off a lot of people like, uh, um, oh, gosh, what is his name again? The uh, Kaplan. Yeah, Kaplan, who was yeah. originally asked to be a part of it, then kind of pushed out of it, so he didn't get to make his mark. Even their attorney, William Weber, right, he jumped All in right. on a lawsuit. The, the uh-huh. family that bought the house after the Lutzes, is that true? They were so stressed because their home was, uh, uh, you know, a, a big site for people now that they actually sued the Lutzes and the publishers of the book? True. Um, Stephen Kaplan was an individual that had his name in the phone book. He was a paranormal investigator, and he's the first person that George Lutz called on this thing, um, trying to find help. Stephen came out to the house and, and initially started to do an investigation, but within two weeks, the Lutzes found out that he was a little um, quirky. He had a degree that came from one of those universities without walls, so to speak. Right. Uh, at least that's the way George explained it to me. There are photographs that exist to this day that show Kaplan with a stake in one hand and a hammer in the other, and, and he called himself a vampirologist. Right. <laughs> um, he was somebody that they felt probably wasn't as professional as they needed. And so he called him and said, well, look, this isn't working out. In the meantime, Lord Adeo had hooked him up with Ed and Lorraine Warren, and they were trying to get Hans Holter at the time to come and investigate the case, who were a little bit more credential and noteworthy. And so he broke off that investigation. Now, that started a vendetta between George and Kaplan that existed for some 20 years. And so Kaplan eventually wrote a book called The Andy the Heart Conspiracy, in which he exposed this as a fraud or a hoax. Yet his co-author, Joel Martin, Um, these days will tell you quite a different story of what he thinks about that house, that it was absolutely um, paranormal in nature. Kaplan based a lot of this stuff, because he'd never interviewed the Lutzes, um, on the book, on the movies and things like that, which we've already stated were creative license. You know, the book wasn't the most accurate, but they did the best that they could with it, and and it is what it is. Now, didn't the, and then the attorney actually, uh, who was Ronald DeFeo's defense lawyer, right? He jumped in and started suing the Lutzes because he felt that they stole his ideas for the Amityville story. This is one of the most interesting parts of the case for me and something that people have never really researched. Now, now we go over the Lutzes story with a fine-tooth comb, and so I did the same thing with William Weber. William Weber was DeFeo's attorney, and in many of the interviews and things that you can find out there on YouTube, there's different inconsistencies in his story. Well, and you know, I'll let's tell you let's why cover that. Let, let's do that. We're going to go to break. I'm getting the, the cut my throat signal from okay. across the board here, and then let's go into William Weber's uh, problems. We'll be right back sure. with more and more with Tim Yancey right after this. Are UFOs real? Does Bigfoot exist? Was Emily Rose really possessed? Who is the next American Idol? She bang, she bang. Oh baby, but she moves, she moves. I'm here. Thank you. We try to answer these questions and more each week 
on the darkness on the edge of town. Try not to fall asleep. We'll only give you nightmares. Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town. Welcome back to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Our guest this evening, Mr. Tim Yancey of Encounters Paranormal Radio Series. He's also a paranormal uh, researcher. You can hear Tim's uh, radio show every Sunday night preceding our show by going to www.encounterslive.com. Uh, if you're in the Florida area on Clear Channel, you can listen to him on WBZT, 1230 a.m. And again, that uh, show is from 9 to 10 Eastern Standard Time, correct? That's true. All right, good deal. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the attorney, and uh, we have about 10 minutes left of the show. Okay. I'll, I'll put this out there as quick as I can. William Weber was Ronald DeFeo's attorney uh, during the trial uh, for the murders. Uh, George had explained to me that once all of this had happened in the house, that it would be unconscionable of them to allow a person uh, like Ronald DeFeo to just rot away in prison without some sort of psychological help. They had felt that what they had experienced in the house may have been the cause for Ronald uh, to commit the murders. So they made an attempt to contact William Weber's attorney. Uh, they did so. And initially, when William Weber spoke about the case, we, we did hear the truth in this. And there have been several versions of it in, in different interviews. But in the Amityville Horror Conspiracy book, on one page 166, there's an interview with William Weber where he states and talks about that initial meeting. And he said, quote, well, this is when I met with them that the initial conversation was just inviting me over. I ultimately went over to see them, and they spoke about dreams that Kathy was having. They spoke about funny feelings and the change in the relationship between themselves and their children, the children fighting amongst each other when they had never done that before, and that they thought maybe it was just that the house was no good. In other interviews, uh, William Weber has also stated that the Lutzes initially contacted him because they were experiencing paranormal phenomenon in the house, and they wanted to know if he had any information in the trial that could help them. Later, that changed. It became he sought them out because he admittedly had a book contract that he wanted to work uh, on with the Lutzes, and then it became the Lutzes seeked him out because they had a book that they wanted to work on. Now, William Weber went on to state that they had together concocted the whole story over many bottles of wine. For instance, uh, Jody, the pig, came from a story that Ronald DeFeo told about a neighbor's cat, who uh, his name was Evan Rood, and he was a big, fat cat, and that he used to sit outside Don's window and stare in the room at her. Well, Don's room was on the third floor, and her window has no access for a big, fat cat, much less you know, a, a mountain climber to get to that window, it would be a near impossibility. So that changed, and it became a little kitten later on. They talked about the green slime that drips on the walls and, and that type of thing. He said that originally that that came from uh, the crime scene photographs, that they were looking at the crime scene photographs together, and they saw the fingerprint dust on the door, and that became the green slime. Later, he stated that it was from spaghetti that was splashed up on one of the walls. So there's a lot of inconsistencies with William Weber's story. It's a moot point, but <clears throat> when you look at what would be the reason for William Weber to create this uh, story, there's a good reason for it and a good motive. William Weber sued the Lutzes because um, he stated that they had um, used a lot of his information to make the book. Hey, good point. If I can say that I helped them make the story, then all of a sudden I become possibly eligible for the best-selling novel of 1979. And um, I just don't buy Weber, Weber's um, story because all the research that I've done, there's been a lot of inconsistencies in what he has said over the years. And if we're going to talk about, you know, inconsistencies in the story. A lot of these players have way more inconsistencies than the Lutzes ever have. Um, I've never heard George change his story in years. I have interviews going back to 77 where he's correcting the Warrens on points of the story. Um, and when it comes to Weber and, and Kaplan and them, their stories just don't ring true for me either. So if he could prove that he helped them invent this story over many bottles of wine, he suddenly becomes eligible 
for a portion of the profits, and I think that that was his motive. Well, now, talking about Kaplan, now, Kaplan, I mean, he came off kind of as a nut as well with a lot of the things that he did. As you said, he was a, a, a vampirologist and would walk right. around and kind of make a big scene of it, and it seemed almost like he was pissed that he got cut out of the whole chance to be a part of this huge story, so he made his own <laughs> version. It's kind of like... You know, uh, uh, to me, it reminds me of Houdini. You're a master at uh, doing this, but when the attention isn't on you anymore, what you do is then you become a debunker of other people's right. legends. And right. uh, and that's kind of what, what Houdini stepped back and started doing with uh, going after psychics and mediums. So this I guy, think that was the case. I, I'll be the first to say that Stephen Kaplan was a passionate uh, uh, investigator. He was very devoted to what he was doing. Um, but he did not have access to, to the Lutzes. He didn't have the ability to interview them and ask them what the real deal was. All of his debunking was based on the book's version and on the movie versions, which George was always the first one to tell you in the various lectures and things that he did, that it was not accurate. You know, it wasn't the best that it could be. Hmm. Interesting stuff. I mean, I don't, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll ever get to the bottom of this, but you would, you would, do you think George is now a resident of the Amityville Horror House again and is, is there kind of watching the legacy, or do you think, uh, you know, believing in what you believe in, that uh, he's, he's washed his hands? <laughs> well, George and Kathy were both very devoted Catholics toward the end of their life. They converted to Catholicism. Kathy had a ministry in Arizona that fed thousands of homeless people every year. George worked with the Salvation Army in Las Vegas, where he lived, um, preparing meals and things like that for the homeless. They were very devoted to their faith. George, every time that I saw him, was carrying uh, his favorite set of rosary beads in his hand. And, and I'm not trying to make a superhero out of the guy or anything, but he's somebody who was very faithful. And I have no doubt that George and Kathy are resting very peacefully without a thought of Amityville in their minds this day, you know? Well, that's good to hear. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, I, like I said, I think it's funny. I, I listen to the guys from the Ghost Hunters who, you know, I love Jay and Grant. They're good buddies of ours. Sure. And every time they're asked, where is your one location you'd love to go, as they always say, we want to go to the Amityville Horror House and just debunk the hell out of it. And, <laughs> and I, well, I laugh true. because it's been you know, almost 40 years or, uh, you know, 30, yeah. 30 years, and nobody's complained about it since. How do you debunk something unless you have the ability to time travel? Go well, there during the the midst of it and be able to debunk what was going on. That's true. I, I love Jason and Grant to death. I know that they uh, really don't buy into the Amityville story. Um, I've had the chance to look into George's eyes and hear him talk about this. I've seen the fear that wells up when he would discuss the last night. I've had dinner with the kids and the family, and we've sat and talked about this stuff. And it's something you didn't hear from them for so long because they chose to put it out of their lives and move on. All three of George's daughters, I'm very proud to say, were youth ministers or are youth ministers with their church. Um, it, it affected them that much. And in doing that, I've had privy to conversations and to emails between them that <clears throat> have definitely proved to me that this was no hoax, that this family lived it that they didn't like to talk about it and that they moved on with their lives. George realized toward the end that there are people out here who are still afflicted with this and made an attempt to step out and do something for the good of the paranormal community and to talk about it and to try to help people to make people talk about this more. Now, Jason and Grant do the same thing with their show. Regardless of what you think of the show, they are out there educating people on the paranormal. And there's people out there that watch their show who go, wow, maybe this is the real deal. And that's good stuff. As long as it's educating people about paranormal phenomenon and about ghosts and things like that, I'm all for it, you know? Yep, totally. I, I, I agree with you on that. It's it's keeping the perspective of the field together is what we all have to work at uh, maintaining, I think. Absolutely. Uh, Are you going to TAPSCON this year, Dave? I am going to be at TAPSCON. Okay, and great. I will be there in, as well. Uh, we, uh, Trish and I bought tickets for that, and I know Jason and Grant will be there, so maybe we can have a big Amityville evening one night. <laughs> no, that would be great. <laughs> get get the debate rolling, huh? Uh, yeah, go. we'll be out there. We'll be at TAPSCON. We'll be out at Mid-South Paranormal Conference with uh, Keith Age yep. out in Louisville again. So. Uh, mm -hmm. You can come out and maybe uh, Tim and I will get some more tattoos together. 
We got there you go. We I'm got ready. tattoos together at the last one, Tim. Yeah, really? we did. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> huh. I got my Godzilla. Tim got a really cool bullet wound uh, yeah. on his chest. <laughs> <laughs> Show me, how, how can people find you on MySpace, Tim? How can they locate you? MySpace.com slash Tim Yancey. Everything about us is on EncountersLive.com. You can jump there and see tons of videos, uh, art, video archives of the show. We're on iTunes now, which is really cool. Um, all that stuff is right there with links to our MySpace page and all of that. Great. And uh, I hear you have an interesting guest coming up in June on the 22nd. Is that right? Um, I have heard rumors. I'm trying very hard. This guy is like the king of paranormal radio. His name is Dave Schrader, <laughs> and I'm working on getting him uh, to come in and do an interview on oh, the 22nd. Good luck. He's a pompous ass. He'll never do your show. <laughs> 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 Yeah, awesome. I'll be out there uh, doing the show with you guys, and that'll lead right into our show for the evening, so I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, any other places you want to promote? We've got about 10, 15 seconds left here. Anything going on? I just want to say thanks for giving an opportunity for the other side of the coin to be heard. Dave, you got the best show in Paranormal Radio. I appreciate you coming on uh, or letting me come on with you, and uh, look forward to doing great things with you. Definitely. I feel the same way, Tim. And thanks for spending your time and evening with us here in the darkness on the edge of town. Thank you all again for tuning into the show. And remember, tune in every Sunday night prior to our show. You can go to EncountersLive.com. Before that, you can check out Ghostly Talk. Go Ghostly Talk, Encounters Live, and then Darkness on the Edge of Town at DarknessRadio.com. We want to thank our guest, Tim Yancey. Talk about uh, the Amityville Horror. You want more information, check out his websites. I just gave you a tickle tonight talking about some of the different inconsistencies of the stories and having somebody give the other side of the coin as opposed to all the hoax rumors. So, again, you can check out AmityvilleHorror.com, AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, and then visit our friends Tim Yancey and his beautiful wife Trish as they host Encounters each Sunday night at www.EncountersLive.com. We'll be back again with you next week in a brand new show thank you for tuning in and spending some time with us here today i hope that you enjoyed today's presentation although it was an oldie it's still a goodie and it's a good way for us to help remember our friend and the first time that we had a chance to work together on radio so tim wherever you are i'm pretty sure it's standing above us laughing right now thank you so much for the years of friendship for the laughter and love and for all of you listening today, I hope that you'll reach out and tell the people in your life that you love them, that you care about them. Because as we remember, sadly, this gift can be taken at any time. But we are so thankful to have had the gift of friendship from Tim Yancey. We'll be back again next week with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Darkness Radio. Darkness Radio.